This is the captain of the Enterprise. Ship shit. Podcasting. The Final Frontier. These are the ridiculous introductions I am forced to read at gunpoint. Or should I say, phaser point. Welcome to Ship to Ship, yet another in the long line of tedious Star Trek podcasts. The show is hosted by David Lawler and David B. Anderson. The two Davids will take you on a journey through time and space every three or four weeks, boldly podcasting where no podcast has gone before. Seriously? This is what you're making me read? Take it away, boys. Good evening, you're listening to Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast. I'm your co-host, David Anderson, and my other co-host is Mr. David Lawler. How are you tonight, sir? I'm all right. That was about 50 seconds of horrible hacking right into my ear. That was fantastic. <laughs> hey, you know, I, I got the Rona, maybe. Who We're knows? We're ha- hacking across the, the USA here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that phlegm race reached a very long distance. What was that, about 5,000 miles? Yeah, just call me Bruno Hakalugi. Maybe, ooh. Maybe it took uh, it took the the scenic route, as it were. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We have uh, we, we tonight. This is uh, our penultimate episode of the of the season, and we're going to be talking about three three classics, really. Kind of well, two two classics and a kind of half classic, like a Mac classic, if you will. Uh, which was- a cla- uh, you know. Uh, well, I mean, we'll get to. The, I think this is. I mean, we're just doing three in this one, and then we're doing another one. We're doing another episode where we're going to talk about next gen, and that's going to be its its own thing. Its own thing, yeah. Because okay, it's yeah, a gimmick. It's to... a gimmick episode, and you're going to enjoy it, I think. Uh, but today we have Deep Space Nine uh, from season six, uh, the episode, the classic episode. Yeah. Uh, co-written by a colleague of mine, Mark Scott Zakri, called uh, um, uh, for crying in the beer for oh far far beyond the stars. Sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. I I blocked out for some reason but anyway yeah mark scott sacri is a is like one of these he's like a he's like a total fanboy who got into the business he wrote this incredible book called the twilight zone companion that served as reference for uh the twilight zone series and provided a lot of interesting information and facts and he wrote the story for this episode uh he did write from what i understand he did write a full teleplay but they didn't like the teleplay so they basically took elements of his story put it into their teleplay um, I was Stephen Bear working on that one. And then, okay, the next one after that will be the Voyager episode 1159, which uh, stars uh, Kate Mulgrew playing, I guess, maybe a great-great-great-great-grandmother or something mm-hmm. back at the, at the time of uh, of the millennium, the new millennium yes. in 2000. And then after that is uh, is a story about T'Pol's great-great-great-great-great-great-grandmother or something. Yeah. Supposedly. <laughs> well, they... It is real. It is real because she has that handbag at the end, remember? Yeah, spoiler. But it's called uh, Carbon Creek, and it's about the actual first contact, even though it's not really officially first contact. No. But because uh, it's about Vulcans who crash land on, on Earth and wind up in Pennsylvania. Yeah, I thought, I mean, not, not to get too much into that third one, but uh, I thought Vulcans, I mean, this wasn't, this, the, 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 it was basically a lie. I mean, she's she kind of lies and says it was all made up, or maybe she just lets them think that, they made she let, she, yeah, I think she's just kind of like playing them a little bit and trying to make uh, it sound like that because she does say, you asked for a story and I I told you a story. Uh, this, I mean, it, it's completely conceivable that the Vulcans, at least in the Star Trek universe, were spying or observing us in some weird yeah. way at the, at a time when we were uh, very... Although I want to say there's a weird sort of congruency between the, the Deep Space Nine and the Voyager episode in the sense that they both seem to visit that same city, that same set, because I swear there's like a part where something's being constructed on the street, like a sidewalk, and like there's a there's a there's like a like a balcony and a thing, and there's like construction stuff going across. And I looked at it and I went, "They're still building that fucking thing." <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I think they did a better job with the production design on the Deep Space Nine episode because uh, it just it looked it, it's really just amazing what they did. Yeah, the, the 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 Voyager was. I mean, a lot of it was in the dark, so you could. It was really in the see. dark, and it kind of looked like things were being taken down and things were being built up. Uh, but first, we start off with Far Beyond the Stars, which is uh, the, really this this the idea is that um, that Cisco 
is undergoing some kind of horrible thing happening to him that is never really explained, which is kind of lame about the episode. Well, don't they say that he had he had a previous incident? Was that in another episode where he had a previous incident? Where he's like, kind of blacking out because he's having weird visions or something like that. Yeah. Now this has to do with the ending of the show when he kind of became one of the one of the one of the like that. These are these are the larger. This is like some sort of thing where he be, kind of became one with a group of people or something. He was like the protectors. He, or something. he becomes a god. I think <laughs> I'm not really sure, but I, th I believe I he kind of becomes a weird God in some and some not in a Star Trek five way either, but we do go back to Benny Russell, um, in a couple of episodes, uh, at the, at the beginning of the seventh season. But mm -hmm. here he is a science fiction writer, uh, named Benny Russell. He works for a magazine called incredible tales. And he sort of, he, he puts himself back in New York, like say at the time of the, I'm going to say it's the mid to late fifties. It looks like, yeah, I was trying. I was trying to like time it when when this was because first I'm like, hey, he's a he's a black dude in a big city just hanging out and talking. I guess I, like things were starting to get better. Yeah, but, and and it creates it takes the characters from Deep Space Nine and puts them there with him. His main yeah, all, yeah. Staff. When he starts to have like when he starts to have the visions, I'm like, ah, hey, the thing. And he's like, well, we see we past. see a couple of people anyway. Like we see the the actor who plays Nog, uh, Aaron Eisenberg, who unfortunately died last year. He was only 50 years <laughs> old and he died playing the newspaper boy. And then he runs into Chief O'Brien. Chief O'Brien. It's interesting. We looked at the episode uh, a couple of days ago, and I was making some observations because I hadn't thought of it before but the characters are kind of almost playing a reflection of themselves and, and some of the behaviors are very interesting and some of the roles that are assigned to these characters. Like, for instance, he works at a magazine called Incredible Tales. He's a science fiction author. And uh, Kira is, is playing a character named Casey Hunter, who is obviously named after DC Fontana because apparently women... Not only women, but black people were not permitted to write science fiction or something like that. I don't know quite what they were worried about back then. Maybe but. it was more that just. I think they kind of get into it. It's like it just won't sell. If they if they know, it won't sell. So it's not like they're legally they're required. It's just it's not going to sell if they know. It's just like sort of like the lamest thing. And the thing we did have the American Civil Liberties Union back then because they did fight fight for people's rights back in those days. But apparently, it's just sort of it's brushed under the carpet. It's it's an under the table situation and. I also noted that uh, that uh, Benny Russell's character, being black, and quite possibly Kira's character too, being a woman, are being paid less than the straight white males in the uh, yeah, probably, in the room. Probably. But the other writers are uh, Armin Shimmerman, who plays Quark, plays a um, an author who is I I do believe that he is a communist or a, a communist sympathizer because a lot of science fiction writers were when you think about it. And what what is it? What do we argue a lot about when we talk about like say the Federation? How do they apply their economics in the 24th century? And people always assume it's a form of socialism, and it might be. It might just be. Well, they don't have money. How else are you going <laughs> to... I mean, if there's no money and everybody's needs are being met, then obviously we're doing something in the vein of socialism. I know that irritates a lot of Star Trek fans, but I do... Oh, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. Well, look, it's, it's, uh, here's the thing. Somehow in sort of this weird utopia that I don't think is ever going to exist, people actually follow the damn rules. And and understand the social contract, and nobody does. Or I mean, maybe or maybe there's just there's no reason to want anymore. Like that's true. They say we've eliminated want. I mean, yeah, but they're they're they've done studies where if they make they kind of did it. I don't know if you saw this thing about rats, where they made like this rat utopia or mouse utopia or something, and everything went great for a little while. And then everything just started to degenerate into horribleness, and they started like fighting each other for no reason, killing each other, cannibalism. Cannibalism, yeah. They had like weird. That's what I would assume. Social. It just sort of collapses in in itself. Whereas having a little bit of struggle and having to compete a little bit actually is. It's kind of like like working out. It's like you need something to kind of work you against. You need to. Yeah, you need to compete in order to live. Live. It's the it's the human. It just works better with humans. The human. Yeah, thrive on competition. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and then we have uh, uh, Chief O'Brien's character playing like a, a guy who's trying not to have an Irish accent. I noticed that because he's kind of talking like this, and he he can't really <laughs> seem to. He's trying to do like an American accent. He sounds you know like what? an Irishman. I he was. I you know I see that face. 
I assume he's Irish. <laughs> yeah, I can't, kind of... I can't. I can't separate him. But it's just him so first... it's it's so obvious that he's trying you to cover up in, his Irish. You'll see him in like a Stephen Frears movie. He doesn't give a half. No, a no, no, no. It's way up in that. Those were like his the, when he was he's doing his serious acting and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, and then we have Julian who is uh, playing some kind of upper crust twit of the year with a pipe and everything. He's like a total stereotypical British kind of guy. Mm-hmm. And but he's also a science fiction writer, and um, oh, yeah, and then yeah. there's Dax. Dax's uh, character is just a secretary that he hired, and she's kind of like bubbly, but but also smart. I mm-hmm. noticed that too. And then don't forget, uh, uh, God, I forgot his name, uh, Rene Auberjonois. <laughs> don't forget the guy whose name I just forgot. Yeah. Odo is is Udo, yeah. yeah. Rene Auberjonois plays the boss. He plays basically the editor in chief. And he's got to answer to somebody, and he never uh, he has a problem with with the the story. Okay, this is really funny, too, because this is actually accurate. The artist came in, played by uh, J.G. Hartzor, who plays Martok on the show. He comes in with uh, with with drawings, really nice kind of sketches. Some of them are kind of sexy and sensationalistic and exploitative, right? And then he comes in with this picture of what looks like Deep Space Nine, except it's not quite Deep Space Nine because it's not as ornate or intricate. It just sort of looks like Something that the U.S. Air Force will come up with, as a matter of fact, it says, it says USAF on it, and it says DS9, and that somehow inspires Benny to go. He takes the drawing and he decides to write a story, and he writes a story about a space station with a um, a black commander, and mm-hmm. that this this is something that is controversial. Apparently, no one will will buy this. No one will. Well, I want I want to take a step back to the beginning of because he's he's trying to be all. Captain Cisco and be powerful and be strong and then he's like he's like he hates every time he tries to do something somebody dies like somebody gets a report of somebody dying and then he meets with his dad and he kind of confides in him a little bit yeah that's true and and he's like he's he's really yeah he he, but this was when it was really starting to get to him especially in the season six because we had just finished a um I forget what we had just finished. A Dominion uh, War or something. There was some sort of Dominion. There's something. a Dominion War. We're sort of still in the middle of it, and it comes to a head at the end of the sixth season, and then we we finish it up a couple of episodes in to the seventh season. Then we have a little bit of a break, and then we go to the final story arc that they have on the show. So, yeah, it's wearing down on him, obviously, and he has a very tough job. And he's, I think I said this, I kind of actually like pinged you while I was watching. I'm like, he is in, he's, he, this is full Avery Brooks mode that he's in full. He's he I am, I am the captain. He's like in your face. He's he very is a strong black man. And, he, and he, as confident as he is, he seems to be carry that confidence a little bit. In, also in New York in the fifties, mm-hmm. uh, He's got a girlfriend that wants to marry him. She she's played by, of course, you know, Penny Johnson, who plays his, mm-hmm. his girlfriend Cassidy Yates, and she she's she's a waitress in a diner. And she's got, always she's always fighting off uh, Worf. <laughs> she's always fighting off yeah Michael Dorn, who plays a baseball player, and they call him Willie. So I'm assuming, and he and he played for the New York Giants, and the New York Giants were still around. Uh, before they went to San Francisco. So I'm assuming it's Willie Mays, except, well, Michael Dorn is a very big guy. Willie Mays was kind of like a small guy. But because uh, he, he stole and a lot honestly, of bases, you know, so he's very Michael fast. Dorn, with, without the makeup, he comes across as so friendly and so accessible. If he tries to play a douche, it doesn't quite work for me. He's too friendly looking to me. But he is, he is kind of a douche because he keeps hitting on her. And he's, got, yeah. he's surrounded by all these girls and he loves his adoring fans and everything. But uh, he he also understands the severity of the situation, the fact that he is a very good black baseball player. And it's very interesting, too, because I was watching, we watched uh, last week that episode of The X-Files about a uh, a black baseball player in the old Negro Leagues who turns out to actually be an alien. And the reason he made himself black is because he thought blacks would never be allowed to play uh, baseball so he could be anonymous and he could be this alien who just loves playing baseball. He just likes playing it. It's a it's an episode. That. Oh, it's the guy he's from one of the Law and Orders. Yeah, Jesse L. Martin plays yeah, the yeah. alien, and the episode was written and directed by Duchovny. It's actually one of the best episodes, even I mean, though it doesn't make much was, sense. Though. That was one of the later ones. That wasn't it one of the later ones when, <coughs> like, in, in order to keep Duchovny around for at least a few episodes, he got to direct some or something. Yeah, they let him direct. So, uh, so Cisco writes a story. Uh, Odo shoots it down. Says you can't have a Negro captain. And he, they start making suggestions. He's like, make the captain white. And he's like, I don't want to do that. This is my story. I want to make it about this guy. Mm-hmm. He says, okay, uh, then it won't get published. And he says, well, what about if you just make it a dream? I think it's um, 
Chief O'Brien's suggestion that they make it a dream, and he's willing to go along with that. So he writes it. it turns out really good. Everybody loves the story and everything. And then, as it turns out, he doesn't get it published, and they pulp the magazine. And I guess they're not going to run a magazine that month, which is weird because you're paying all these people. You mm-hmm. should at least run a magazine. You're trying to keep well, a business well, they, going. Not only do they pulp it, they fire his ass. They basically tell him to, uh, and this is right after right after he was beaten nearly to death by a couple of cops, played by yeah. Jeffrey Combs and Mark Alamo. So he, he goes back to work. They fire him. They pulp the magazine. They're not going to do it. He has a total psychotic breakdown. And this is like, this is something, it's a very interesting performance because you could possibly laugh at it for being excessive and over the top. Mm. But then you look at him yelling and screaming and he's crying. And yeah, he's, he gets... He's he first he's like it's he's he's yelling he's very pissed and then about halfway through like the single sort of manly tear goes down and he's like oh he's he's he he's feeling it and, and he, I think you know a lot of a lot of this is like he he's look he's a black man in America he's dealt with a lot of crap so this is not probably a stretch for him this this kind of like pissed offness about be, things being unfair we can all work together it's a very hopeful message even though. It ends with him collapsing, and he's taken away in an ambulance. Uh, I, th- I think also it does help that it's Avery Brooks, and he sells it. He does. He he also acknowledges racism, though, also, which is very interesting. Um, later, There was a later episode <clears throat> that takes place in the 60s in a holodeck, and he's arguing with uh, Cassidy about not wanting to participate in this adventure that they're having on the holodeck because he didn't like the way black people were treated back then. And I thought that was very interesting that they would actually put that in a Star Trek episode that they would acknowledge it even though we're living in a 24th century that's utopian and all humans get along and what we do is we on the show on in the franchise in every show we see we see an analogy for what we once were by looking at aliens that are violent intolerant and and destructive well i mean you could say i mean maybe it's on the i mean look the you can't have a lot of stuff happening without conflict. There were they were always getting in skirmishes with each other about like you know, especially with Starfleet, especially in the movies. There was always some sort of thing where like Picard was having to like uh, fight Starfleet for something. Like Starfleet was always up to something, and Picard had to like not follow orders or something. Well, I was I always felt like uh, Picard always wanted to do the right thing. The same with uh, Cisco, always wanted to do the right thing. Janeway too, and Archer. You know, mm-hmm. all of them. And Kirk. It, it, it just, they, they always wanted to try to do the right thing, and sometimes their hands were tied. But mm-hmm. a lot of times they were just like, fuck it, I'm going to do it anyway. Mm-hmm. You know? That's that's just how they saw So this is this is very rightfully considered one of the greatest episodes of Deep Space Nine. I remember seeing it when I first saw it uh, back in 1999. I believe uh, I was still dating my wife. I, I don't know if we were engaged yet. No, I don't think we were engaged. We were just dating at the time. But I, I was at her apartment, and it was on. And I was like, oh, my God, what's going on here? They're all dressed it, like uh, like contemporary people. They're in the 50s or something. It's mm-hmm. a science fiction mag. This episode really blew me away. It totally blew me away. What did you think? Uh, you know, I I enjoyed it. But I, I when I went in, at first I didn't exactly know what was going on. Because you guys like, oh, he's, he's having a vision. Was it? Because I, I was yelling. Ah, it's him. Ah, it's him. It's him. And then and I'm like, oh, okay, it's gonna be some sort of thing where, because look, you already told me what the what the agenda was and what we were gonna be watching, so I generally knew what I was getting into. But I, I liked it. I liked it. And I, like, I like it because I haven't watched it much Deep Space Nine. So then I'm watching it. These have been the few last few I've been watching. They've been very sort of heavy Avery Brooks sort of showcase pieces, mm-hmm, and I, mm-hmm. I do enjoy him on the and show. And he, he directs this episode, too. And he directs this episode, and and it's... I was actually wondering, like, how much is he going to be in it if he directed it? Because sometimes it's like they don't put them, like, with, with Frakes, or, like, uh, when he like, directs... Yeah, Frakes', is, Frakes is early directorial stuff, he's, like, on the sideline for most of it, you know? Because mm-hmm. he just wants to operate the camera, and he wants to hold up his fingers and go, that's a great shot. Mm-hmm. But here, Avery Brooks is like, well, I mean, he's he's he directed before. He directed a... A somewhat controversial episode of Deep Space Nine, which had uh, Jadzia meeting the the previous host of of someone her host uh, was married to, and it's ah, a kind I'm, of I think I saw that one. I I'm, and there was a kiss, but they kept calling it a lesbian kiss, but I didn't really see it as a lesbian kiss because these were two people that were once a man and a woman. Yeah, know? well, like, that's what Star Trek does. They'll mess with you with the gender stuff. 
So you really can't you you can't you can't call it lesbian. It's well, more... remember there was that one episode where Riker was like this sort of like mid gender person that I guess but was played by female, so it was okay. Was played by a female, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I for me for Star Trek fans, this is nothing new for us. We we were always. When we watch this stuff, even back to the original series, there was a lot of controversial stuff that you could cover up in the in the in the haze of science fiction. You could call mm-hmm. it al- allegory, or you could call it an analogy for something. I mean, mm-hmm. they were always pushing that territory. That's that's what was so great about science fiction, which is what's so fascinating about the Incredible Tales magazine office that all these people work in. They're writing stories about robots. They're writing stories about alien love affairs. You know that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Well, and then, I will. I will always be thankful to Next Generation because you got this whole group of women around my age and even younger that love sexy bald men in charge, and that's me. <laughs> yeah. So great. Let's let we move on to uh, Voyager now. Mm-hmm. In this episode, okay, the Voyager, Voyager and Carbon Creek are more similar to each other than Far Beyond the Stars because Far Beyond the Stars is just a character imagining himself. Oh, I forgot. There is an addendum to Far Beyond the Stars that occurs later in the seventh season, mm-hmm. where Cisco flashes back into Benny Russell and he's in a mental institution and he's mm. writing a story, a deep space nine story on the walls with a pencil. Oh, and they, yeah. they keep cleaning the walls and, and he keeps writing his story. So we do go back to that. Character. Oh, and there was another thing. According to lore, I don't know how true this is, but according to lore, deep space nine was originally supposed to end with Benny Russell waking up from a dream as though he, completely dreamed up the entire seven seasons. Oh, the whoa, they were going to go full, uh, I was going to either say seen elsewhere or perhaps uh, Newhart. <laughs> it was all a dream. but they, or, Yeah, it's, or uh, Dallas. Thankfully, yeah. cooler heads prevailed because I think that would have completely robbed that, us. Honestly, that Celtics. would have been a great episode to sneak in this, like the middle of the seventh season and you're like, oh, shit, and then it isn't. Like That could have been an interesting idea. Though. Could have been. But as, as it turns out, it's just really kind of Cisco sorting through some things. He's just going through the junk in his brain and seeing, envisioning himself and the people around him in that environment back then. It's very interesting. But we move on to 1159, which I said shares more in common with Carbon Creek because it's about possible people that were related to other people. 1159 is uh, basic. I think they're thinking about family in this episode. Janeway is thinking about... She was talking about Shannon O'Donnell, I believe is her name, who was an engineer. And this is what I maybe maybe I wasn't paying attention. I thought I was, but she seems to be surprised that she was became a Janeway or something like that. She married that guy that was actually Janeway. Well, no, I I, I think surprised about that. I'm like, well, that's your name, isn't it? Well, I think it's weird because we're seeing one thing and hearing another. She Janeway assumed always from the family history that. Her great 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 grandmother or whatever, back in 1999, meets up with a guy named Henry Janeway in a small town in Indiana, mm-hmm. where they're building up a thing, a structure. They're trying to build a thing called the Millennium Tower, the Millennium Gate, mm-hmm. and it's supposed to celebrate the new millennium as it's about to happen. And this episode came out in 1999, so they were trying to do that. She's between jobs. She her car breaks down. And she's stuck in this town for the duration until she can get enough money to pay for a car. She doesn't have a job. She was recently laid off from – she's an aeronautical engineer. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a point of pride for Janeway. That was something I, – I mean, I heard stories about my family over the years about who they might have been related to or who, how important they might have been. Have you had, had anyone ever told you about a member of your family or something like that? Uh, all I know is, is that way back one of them came over on the Mayflower. But oh well, wow! For that's... all I know, that could be bullshit. For all I know, it that's the, the and that's the problem with this episode is that she she has been only given half the information as far as she knows. But we see, I guess, what we're seeing is what she is. It, it might be the truth. I think it might be the truth. I'm not really sure, but. Well, I'm t- I mean... Tom Paris comes in and kind of deflates her bubble a little bit, and he says, I never heard of anybody named Shannon O'Donnell who worked on the Mars Project or anything like that. That's true. I mean, when I – first of all, uh, maybe, maybe I'm mistaken about what was going on then, but I don't remember computers and laptops being that small. I oh, no, no, no. They were. They definitely – I, I have the, one. I have one of them. Did she have Wi-Fi? Because was there I, Wi-Fi? Then? She probably – it's just probably just a phone line, but I don't, I don't know what she's doing on her laptop exactly. I don't quite know. Maybe she can use a phone line and send an email or something. I didn't but see it. it I, like have, it I have a laptop from that time. It's Windows 3. It was slow as hell. Oh my God. This computer – and it was very small. It had like – I think <laughs> – it had like 200 – 
a 200 megabyte hard drive is what it had. It was, but it was it was the same kind of con- it was very small, but it was also a big a block. It was like a big bulky block with a very small screen, and it only had like I don't know what 256 colors, right? So I, you could in theory look at a few things, but it wouldn't be I, it, you know. It, to use the vernacular, it would take like a whole night to download one picture. Well, know? and everything was fifty six k then too. I don't think there was maybe if you maybe were, even what? maybe even less, maybe fourteen point four. <laughs> yeah, I look. I remember because we got a computer in ninety late ninety nine. Actually, probably around. It would have been a computer made around this time, but it was like a you know it had a seventeen gigabyte hard drive, which is amazing. That's and that's big. That's big. At the time, yeah, and it was fifty six k. We were lucky to have fifty six k at the time. Now and there may have been. Yeah, and one. then you, you you dial in, you know. Oh yeah, I'm. And you'd hear yeah. the voice, "Welcome," you know. <laughs> <laughs> but apparently, I mean, like her computer is enough to impress this guy. Um, well, she she stops into this bookstore, which is which is uh, owned by a guy named Henry Janeway, who is played mm. by that evil asshole from Lost. Do you remember? Yeah, he played uh, Locke's dad, supposedly. He played Locke's dad, stole his Who fucking wasn't really kidney. Who was just a scam artist. And, to... and possibly uh, did something terrible to uh, to the other guy, Jack Sawyer or something, or whatever his name was. And, uh, yeah, he was, like, evil. He was an evil bastard. And I was, like, I was watching. I remember when I first saw this episode, I was, like, because I saw it after I saw Lost, I think. Because I didn't really watch Voyager back then because UPN, I don't know. I don't know what it was. Well, it, it was on lots of weird stations at the time. Yeah. Or, or actually, no, I was working. It was always on Fridays, and I was always working Fridays at night, so I never got to see it. I did catch the pilot, but that, that, that was all I could catch at the time. So I'm looking at this later, after I've already watched Lost and gotten pissed off because Lost pissed me off, season <laughs> six and all that. We won't get into that. I don't want to think about that. That never happened, as far as I'm concerned. No. Um, <laughs> it was all a dream. When, they wakes, when, he, when Jack wakes up, he's For fuck's he's a, sake, it was all a dream. <laughs> He's a he's Cisco, you know. He's a bald black man on a space station. So, and then I'm looking at this, and I'm like, oh my god, this guy. I know this guy. I hate this guy. This is that guy. No, he's playing a good guy in this. But he's a sweet, he's a sweet older man. He seems a little bit older for Janeway. I know Janeway was already in her forties at that time. Yeah, I was trying to do the math. He kind of seemed like her grandfather. I was I was doing like what I was doing. I was doing like the Mrs. Columbo math. Because I'm thinking, I'm just, cause here's this why. This is a because new I'm, equation now. We have a, a new yeah, equation. We'll because, call it the Mrs. Yeah, she, Columbo math. I was doing the math. I'm like, okay, she's probably in her early 40s when she's doing this. This is 99. She did Mrs. Columbo in the late 70s. She literally would have been in her early 20s when she was doing Mrs. Columbo. Mm-hmm. Uh, Peter Falk was already like 80 then. So I don't exactly know how that Or Was he her daughter? Or I don't even remember. I know she was Mrs. Columbo. In the, it was in the late 70s. I know. But, but it's like so obvious that Henry Drainway is kind of advanced in years. Mm-hmm. Even, it's so, it, but it's a very sweet story. This is a very sweet kind of chick flicky kind of story, if you want to think about it that way. Because let's face it, Voyager had a feminized quality to it by having the female captain and all the very strong female characters that were a part of the show. I want to commend Kate Mulgrew again. Man, she is such a pro at re- – because she's always reeling off like the technical stuff of what she's trying to say and then her sort of her – all I can say is like the niambic pentameter of her voice mm-hmm. kind of – the way that she talks, it's like she's reeling off those lines like nothing. She's wonderful, and can you and imagine? I, can you imagine Genevieve Bujol doing that? I mean, I can't. Uh, oh no, <laughs> and that's why you wouldn't be able to understand the damn word she was saying if she was trying no. to do that. Yeah, but Kate McGrew is is wonderful. She's a wonderful actress, and she really makes this part come alive, especially even Shannon O'Donnell. So she's hanging out with Henry Janeway and trying to get to know him and his cause. He's the only holdout on this block where they need to demolish so they can make room for this Millennium Gate. Then it could bring jobs. It could really fix up the economy. But Henry Janeway is kind of like an old curmudgeon man. Isn't who, he kind of, I just realized he's kind of living in that house in Up. Like that, that one old man and then that building is like a random. And <laughs> I just, you know, it's really strange. The bookstore looks a lot like Curious Goods from Friday the 13th, the series. It's got two levels. It's got kind of a balcony area. Yeah, it wouldn't it's have been the very, same. It's a very that, nice. I, I love the production design of the of the bookstore. It's, it's a fantastic. I'm sure that was film. shot in Canada. So and this is you all think? LA. So I, well, Friday the 13th was shot in Canada. I know. Well, that I know that. But Voyager was shot in L.A. It's possible that they. They either built the set or moved it. Maybe they scrapped place. the set. Well, I mean, by then, Friday's Earth would have been canceled. They could have scrapped the set and brought it over. Who maybe, knows? maybe, maybe. A lot of work, though. And they did. Uh, Voyager suffered from budget cuts later on because UPN didn't want to continue financing. It's very strange around that point. Their commercials, uh, there were more commercials on the air. 
So the running time of the shows went down. It started off at like 46 and change for each episode, and then it went down to like 43 minutes. So they snuck in some more now, commercials. Did they, I, did, how many episode seasons, though, did, did, did they do? Like, they, were they were more than 22, weren't they? Were they like 24, 26? Oh, uh, well, some, no. Well, the first season was 15 episodes. Oh, that's right. Because yeah, cause, it was, cause they started late, yeah. Yeah, it was a mid-season thing, like Deep Space Nine, so it didn't get full season, the full, a full first season. And then finished up in 2001, right? Yeah. Yeah. The final season was 2001 because that was when Enterprise began. And again, Enterprise was another show that suffered from budget cuts. They're, they were they were bringing in these episodes at this point. They were bringing in, in these episodes at less than $900,000 per episode. Ah, that's, which, that's like... That's a Babylon 5 level budget. <laughs> it is. It is. Because especially if you compare it to um, Next Generation, which was like a two to three million. You think they, well, especially per with, episode. Especially with, uh, uh, with Enterprise, you know, by then they were able to do everything on computer. So maybe they saved money doing it that way. Pro probably. But this episode doesn't really have any visual effects per se because it takes place in, you know. It's a period piece, just like I felt like lots of crane shots, lots of. <laughs> there were a lot of crane shots, definitely. The same with um, with uh, Deep Space Nine. Not Carbon Creek so much, though. There were maybe one or two crane shots in Carbon Creek. So she she is fighting with Henry Janeway. She wants him to shut down this bookstore so that they can build this Millennium Gate. She's been offered a job on the project by uh, this guy. Uh, what, I wish I could remember this actor's name. I always have a tough time with this guy because he's been in everything. Um, I remember I've already forgot. I, when he, I watched he was on, him, he, he was on the Drew Carey show playing Drew's trans, oh, transvestite oh, uh, brother. Uh, John Carroll Lynch. John Carroll Lynch. There you go. Yeah, this guy's everything. And I think like he's he's riding that line between is he a douche or is he actually like training? He's, he's like right on the edge of like he's he's kind of a douche, but he's also like kind of an okay guy. He kind of cuts her a break. At he the is end. a nice guy. He's not a bad guy. No, he's, he's not a bad guy at all. He's just no, trying, he's 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 trying to help her out. He understands. American. He's an interesting, yeah. he's an interesting guy. Cause he's not quite an antagonist. If anything, yeah. I think Henry's the antagonist in this situation. Yeah. He's, um, he's, he's very stubborn about what he's, what he thinks he's trying to do. Yeah. Like, yeah. He, he, he wants to hold on to tradition and all that. Mm -hmm. And uh, tradition can be a good thing and it can be a bad thing. As we know, right. we've talked about that before. And eventually, they sort of uh, they fall in love in a weird way, mm -hmm. and uh, the kid likes the kid likes her, mm -hmm. and uh, she he decides I guess I'm going to follow you around I'm going to follow you, so it's a it's a very interesting message there where she's kind of the man, <laughs> mm. <laughs> she's the kind of the man in the relationship well, because like the, he, he follows end, her he decides end, to drop everything and follow her at the end he's she's kind of like the voice of reason. Or he's she's like and they kind of make a deal where it's like they can have he can still have his store, but in in the sort of the Millennium Tower thing. Yeah. So yeah. he doesn't really lose his store. And it's sort of I a mean, compromise. You know what it kind of reminded me of? Alice doesn't live here anymore. The Scorsese movie. Oh. Remember when Chris Christopherson, they they couldn't figure out how they wanted to end the movies. Chris Christopherson improvised. He said, OK, let's go to Monterey together. I'll go with you. And that sort of reminded me of it. They, you know, they, uh, they compromise, but at the same time, he gets kind of gets what he wants. And, well, he gets, and he gets to have her. You can die alone. Hey, you know, you have a choice in life. You can die alone, or yeah. you can be with someone who is who can tolerate you. Yeah. You know? Well, you you get you got the lucky end of that stick because I'm still working on that. And <laughs> but also, when you think about it, when everyone else around him is sold, anyway, you can't win. You really can't win. You're going to just sit there and be. Yeah, and and that the whole town is going to hate you. Yeah. You know? It's like, okay, because they kind of said they had a backup plan of like, we'll, we'll move here. Of like, you do realize that that kills the town. Yeah. Everyone, like everybody's moving out because they've already sold, but then they can't sell. All of their property is devalued now. Yeah. A whole, like, I mean, it becomes Hill Valley, ultimate Hill Valley 1985, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, dude. Come on. After after Biff becomes president, yes, he didn't become so, president. And in the bookend of the of the episode, I mean, I I don't think Janeway is completely convinced. Uh, she wants to think because they found a photo. Yeah, they kind of double. They kind of like double. They kind of do it wrong, where it's like they show the picture and then they frame the picture. It's like it would have been better if they'd had like somebody finding it reacting to a screen but not you don't see it and then at the end you see the picture that i think that at the end you see the picture 
they the the crew well the, her senior officers there gather and they take a picture mm-hmm. and it's it's a very sweet thing unfortunately you know Kate Mulgrew was a real babe back then. Um, mm-hmm. She kind of grew older. She got, you know, she she kind of aged, and she doesn't yeah. really look like that. She doesn't look like she doesn't look like she did with. It's like it, it looked like her, but with a shit ton of like weird makeup. And I know I know it's cruel. It's it's cruel to think about because I remember Carrie Fisher saying something in her wishful drinking show that you she didn't know that she was you know signing a contract that would that would make. That that she would be required to look like that for her entire life, how she looked in Jedi. Well, know? now look, now wait a minute, now, now with the, the cable girl, she's already in her early mid forties by the time the show ends. That's a good run. <laughs> yeah, she was run. about. I, I would say she was about. I think she turned forty when the show started. So wow. this was the fifth 40, season. She, she was already forty five. Yeah, that that's a good run. It is really good. So for, that, those soft know. focus lenses do help. I mean, that whole show was kind of shot that way. The little Star Trek effect there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but like I said, charming episode. What did you think of it? I I enjoyed it, but I got confused about like, well, wait a minute. Why is she? She seems confused about sort of the the lineage, and why is she a Janeway? It's like, of course she's a Janeway. You're a Janeway, and 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 they have that picture, and then what they do is they kind of zoom into the picture a little bit and kind yeah. of like rest of what was going on and yeah but i i did like it i i liked it uh we'll get to i mean we'll get to the next one i actually I, I also liked i thought the reality was that janeway or shannon o'donnell shannon o'donnell janeway mm-hmm. uh did not head up the mars project instead she basically settled down and got married to a man she fell in love with and perhaps did some aeronautical engineering, but her name wasn't enough to get into the history books, I think. And I think Janeway was maybe, it was a point of pride that she thought that this person was part of her family because she wound up becoming um, um, a starship captain. So that's what I think. I think reality, the reality was that she just ha- had a family. And I think family is the most important thing because, you know, we see the connection of her with her with her crew and then we see we cut to the picture and the picture becomes alive yeah they have she's, like the, the, she's they an create, old woman and she's surrounded by children they create the family day like yeah they, whatever the family day and again the, the it's very the cute Kling, who who is the klingon like the oh balana balana her klingon makeup i don't know if it's like through this or the whole show man she's got that's a that's a forehead right there it's like she's like half forehead <laughs> That makeup, like, it's, I guess maybe it's the shape of her face, but she's literally, like, half forehead. I, I saw a little meme today, a little joke that's probably in poor taste. But it's Seven of Nine. It's a picture of Seven of Nine with Balana, and Seven of Nine tells her, I want to ride your forehead. Ooh! <laughs> Actually, that's, it's it's uh, completely you know tasteless. I'm sorry. If you know female anatomy, that, that'd probably feel real good. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and we're going to... Now we're going to, Ed, we're going to we're going to move on to an episode of Enterprise. Yes. The uh, second episode, the second episode of the second season of Enterprise, and it's called Carbon Creek. And it's by default already even the second episode into that season. It's the best episode of the season for me. Anyway, I, there were some really nice episodes that I enjoyed uh, in the second season. But this one is, again, we, we kind of time travel, but not quite. We're we're seeing. Uh, basically, nobody else is in this episode except for Archer, Paul, and Trip, right? And they're having dinner. Archer's kind of a little Snoop sister. He looked into her personnel file, found out that she, uh, uh, while they were when they were recently on Earth, that she went to a couple of places like Yosemite National Forest, which is interesting. She wanted to see the place where Captain Kirk tried to climb a mountain. Yeah, all uh, the parts of <laughs> Yosemite, although Yosemite wouldn't happen, uh, that, that incident at Yosemite would not the the Captain Kirk climbing a mountain. And why is he climbing a mountain? Because it's that there. That wouldn't happen for 100, 200 years. Because it's there. Because That's it's why. there. Because yeah. he's there. <laughs> so maybe she knows something more about time travel than she's supposed to. Anyway, um, so uh, they find. Uh, he says, you went to a small mining town called Carbon Creek in Pennsylvania. Why? And she's like, I wanted to visit the first site of uh, the, fu- the site of uh, Vulcan's first contact with Earth. And they're like, come on. Didn't you see Star Trek first contact? Obviously, it was up from Cochrane, <laughs> Right? Bozeman, Montana. And he's like, no. So she proceeds to tell them a story about how her great 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 grandmother, uh, which pisses off Trip because he's like he's always trying to figure out how old she is. We do find out later on she's in her sixties, uh, for a Vulcan. Yeah, that was where I got a little confused. I'm like, is she playing herself? It's like, no, she's not playing herself. But you have to play yourself. See, 
David, if you did an episode, if you told me a story about your great, 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 great grandfather, you mm-hmm. would be playing that part. Yeah, we put a wig on me, maybe some darker makeup. <laughs> and and you could wear breeches and long stockings, and uh, you would look like Captain Morgan on the Spice Rum you know, bottle. I, I, you know how I play it? I play it exactly like my dad. I would like, I'd have like kind of a big, almost like afro, and I'd wear glasses, <laughs> and I'd be very confused. And be like, oh, oh, that, that's how I play it. <laughs> oh, what? Uh, who, uh, what? Every time you talk about your dad, I get a completely different picture. Now you're making him sound like Jim Backus from Gilligan's Island or, or, or Mr. Magoo. Well, Jim Backus would be, oh, 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 that would be my brother. Oh, oh, oh. Lovey. You know, oh, she never oh, had a name, oh, by oh, the way. My brother, yeah. She was always known as Lovey. Yes. I don't know why. But, um, uh, okay, so, so we go back to the 1950s when Sputnik was first launched. The Soviets beat us into space with their stupid little satellite. And uh, Vulcans are are sort of just case in the joint. They're looking around. They're doing observation. You know, they're trying not to interfere. The very big deal. But unfortunately, they're having a problem with their ship. They crash land in the forest. Their captain dies. So T'Pol is next in line. Or I'm sorry, T'Pol's um, great 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 grandmother. I don't know what to call her. I forget her name. Let me let me just check. I forgot it too. I forgot it too. I'm gonna have to check and see. While you're doing that, I wanna I wanna give special shout out. She's actually a really good actress. She is wonderful. Jolene, and, we 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 Jolene mentioned Blaine. that before. We mentioned her before, and somebody that hot you wouldn't think is like it, but she's got she's got it. Whatever it is, she's got it now. She's she because she has to do she has to kind of have to do two things. She has to be Vulcan and hold it all in, but then she also has to give a performance where you feel like emotion. Mm. Like sometimes, yeah, sometimes she does her. let it out, like especially if she is like being if she's being manipulated by certain circumstances, mm-hmm. or if she's responding badly to something that's having a bad effect on her. Sometimes she'll let it out. Mm-hmm. You know, she's it's just, yeah, yeah. Uh, the thing it's it, a lot of people like to think that uh, oh Tamir Tamir is her name Tamir. Okay. A lot of people think that just because you're a pretty girl, you're not going to be a good actress. It's not always true. Jerry Ryan is a fine actress. Marina Sirtis was a fine actress. To Paul, uh, Jolene Blaylock is a fine actress. Yeah, they had to wear bunny suits. Maybe it was demeaning, but it was very easy on the eyes for for for, for hey, us you know, men watching. Damn it! Like third lead on a on a on a sh- on like a network show, UPN, but still network show. That is that's that's making some money right there. I, uh, I'll do whatever you want. You want to pay me fifty grand to just wear a tight outfit? Fifty grand. But a lot of times. I, they had to be sewn into those outfits, so they had I'll to time their bathroom breaks. Hey, they, had, they had to time their bathroom breaks, and I read some stories about how Jerry Ryan, it was a nightmare for her because she had to go to the bathroom, and if if she had to, they had to make a big deal out of it. They had to cut her out of the outfit. She had to run, use the bathroom, and then get back in and all this while money is being spent. You know, time mm-hmm. is money on these shows. These, uh, these three Vulcans, Tamir, Mestrel, and the third guy who looks like... Um, who looks like uh, a Three Stooges guy. <laughs> Gets... Don't they even mention that, like, Mo? Yeah, they said he looks like Mo. Mm. Uh, Strawn is his name. No, I'm sorry. Yeah, Strawn. Yeah, so they, they crash land, and uh, they don't want to eat meat. <laughs> you know, there's meat. There's deer everywhere. It's it's upstate Pennsylvania. I know the area. My family grew up in that area, too, because they mentioned Doylestown. On my mother's side of the family uh, came from that area in Bucks County. And it's called Bucks County because there are bucks, you know, deer. Anyway, they, they go into town. They steal some clothes. She puts a dress on backwards, which is hilarious. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah, that was funny. <laughs> and uh, they go into this bar looking for food or something like that. They have no money. They need money. Apparently, Vulcans don't use money. This uh, Mestrel uh, hustles uh, pool games and wins a whole bunch of money. They get frozen dinners. They take an apartment. Well, it don't, looks forget, like... don't, don't forget the, the, the woman at the bar because she plays into the, the whole story later. Yes, yeah, she is. Uh, she's actually, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, uh, the, the third Cusack. Yes, yeah, she's Anne Cusack. Yeah. And she is the sister of John and Joan. Yes. And kind of looks a little bit like them, too. Mm-hmm. And she she develops a, a crush on uh, on Mestrel and Mestrel kind of yeah. likes her, too, which is weird. It's a little weird. It's a little weird what happens, but we'll get to that. 
Yeah, see, now uh, they this, take this they take sad. a Fonzie style apartment. It looks like yeah. a Fonzie style apartment above a garage or something. Uh, yeah, it's everything's so easy for him. It's like th- th- this guy's gotten got this, this woman falling in love with him. Like you know how hard it is. Look, I'm a good looking guy. I'm working hard. I'm out there trying to get something going on. I can't get nothing. This well, guy, you're not you're not a Vulcan, dude, and you're not. Uh, you know, I, mean, I like, don't have this this brick wall to penetrate. So they why can... does everybody fall in love with Spock? You know, I mean, it's like you know, Spock got he's the mysterious. most fan mail of all of all the because cast he's, he's unattainable he's mysterious you know he has to be like dark and disturbed. he's considered I'm sexy dark. even though my wife is always like i don't i don't i don't see the appeal i she's a mccoy girl she loves mccoy mm. this is just kind of like the way he is i don't know why she never fell for kirk either kirk is like you know shatner back in his well, prime I, I, well it makes sense she's into mccoy I mean, she married you you're like a grumpy dude you know it makes I'm sense a grumpy dude grumpy <laughs> damn it jim uh damn it, jim. So, so uh, T'Pol takes a job at the bar sweeping and cleaning up. Uh, Mestrel gets a job in a mine. He works in the mines. And Strawn, the, the Mo-looking dude, is a plumber. So they all, I guess, make money. They all do pretty he well. He finally gets fed up with the tools and just uses his, his tricorder or whatever that thing is. Just he clean. uses like a little phaser thing to, to, yeah. to, to seal a leak. You know, and and they're just trying. They they they're trying to set up some kind of a you know a distress call so that Vulcans their their fellow Vulcans can pick them up. So they have to lay low in this town, and everybody likes them. You know, it's very interesting how they how they kind of settle in. You'd think with this kind of a story, it would go the other way, and they would be accused of witches as witches uh, or something. I will say, I appreciated that they actually had like the Vulcan makeup because when they do Vulcan, they almost look Romulan. When they do the Vulcan makeup in some things, like with, especially with Spock, they kind of started making him look a little greenish. But as they went on, he just he just seemed to wear regular regular sort of. They flesh stopped clothes. doing it, and they also changed his ears up. In the movies, his ears are are a little bit different. They're the little kind of poking. They're sticking they're more, out at an angle. Yeah, they're more they're more sort of like pointy and angled, and and and, and more. They're not like. They're not like sticking out, almost like rubbery things. They're like these sort of almost like there was yeah. Like there, there was a very simple explanation for that. Um, mm. They tried to use the original ears for the movie when it came out the the motion picture, mm-hmm. but uh, Nimoy's ears changed. They got a little bit bigger because your ears grow as you grow. Yeah, your ears grow, your nose grows, everything. Grows. And they kind of sagged a little bit mm. because as you grow older, they sag a little. So they kind of they had to work around his ears, so mm-hmm. to speak. But yeah, they of course they've always done a fine job with the makeup. And uh, so Anne Cusack has a son who is a genius and is trying to get into school and she's trying to raise money. So because he could only he only got he only managed half a scholarship and um, it doesn't look like he's going to get into school. So Mm -hmm. what 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 does the the Tamir do? She she does something completely uncharacteristic. She actually cares about this kid because I guess they bonded over meditation and astronomy. She takes apparently Vulcans invented Velcro. (laughs) So she takes this this Velcro. Yeah, again, it's like Star Trek is always messing with the continuity. It's like then, but then I I just it's I literally like, flash uh, back Star Trek transparent like, aluminum. It's like they're transparent aluminum. Yeah, well, how do you know he didn't invent the thing? You know. <laughs> and as it turns out, and this really blew my mind because I wrote a review of this episode that has yet to be published. It'll be published, I guess, maybe in a couple of months. But uh, I looked up Velcro, and it turns out it was invented by a man named George D. Mistral. Which mm-hmm. means that she probably gave that name to the guy that she sold the Velcro to. Unfortunately, it's a little off. They wanted this to coincide with Sputnik. I guess maybe they wanted Sputnik to be a curiosity point for the Vulcans mm-hmm. to go and see what's going on on Earth. So they launched a satellite into space so the Vulcans show up. But unfortunately, Velcro was invented two years before Sputnik was launched. So they were off by two years. But that's fine. That is totally fine to me. This is because this is a wonderful episode. They the Vulcans show up after getting their distress signal. Mestrel decides he wants to stay, and it's like I'm I'm really kind of confused about this because I don't know how you're gonna explain Mestrel should anything happen to him, right? Well, doesn't he does doesn't he basically like they just say that he died? Like this is another thing. It's like I'm going to assume he... that he shacked up with Anne Cusack, probably at some point revealed his secret to her because uh, well, I don't know how you can keep that from her. Here's the thing. <laughs> I think what he did was actually to go back to what like uh, I forgot her name already. Uh, the T'Pol character, Tamir, right? Tamir, what she said to the Vulcans, she lied. She lied to those Vulcans that said that he died. Yeah, he yeah. obviously didn't die. That's true. Yeah, 
And I'm like, Logan's well, don't lie. Why? That was a little like, what? what's going on there? Like, that's where I was like, how much of this is true? How much of this story is true? Now, some I, of it's true because you got the thing at the end. But I mean, like, and I think I think I think was, Vulcans are capable of lying because you know how they dress up their lies. They call them omissions. They call yes. them oversights, an exaggerations. An and error. Vulcans do fucking lie. They lie on this show all the time. All they're right. absolutely they're not perfect. They're no. they're bigoted. They're you know, they they have a superiority complex. They I held back I, the, the warp program for like a hundred years. Yeah, yeah. They they're capable of lying. I think Vulcans are capable absolutely Vulcans are capable of lying. They just choose not to because they find it unethical. No, but, but if I, this is this is like a little white lie by comparison, I guess. I think that what I think that what the guy did was, you know, because remember they put the they put the money in the jar so they could go to go to school. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I think it's what she said, where it's like he just he went off kind of like the Incredible Hulk, and he just went dun, off and had dun, little dun, adventures. Dun, yeah, dun, had little dun, Vulcan dun. adventures because he, as a Vulcan, the adventures of Mestral. Yeah, a smaller series. As a Vulcan, he knew he he he's got to lay low. Probably not. I mean, he if he if he took a mate and had a child, and the the DNA is compatible. I don't know if they knew that then to know that like that could really mess up the future. Maybe he had plastic surgery. Also, to Possibly. make himself look more human, and probably if if Ann Cusack had any ch- children, I'm not, I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure. It's it's very sweet though. It was a very sweet thing. And Tripper's jaw, a trip, Trip's jaw is on the floor hearing this mm-hmm. because it does sound plausible. But then he's like, and he goes, Ah, you you're just pulling one on us. Yeah. And she's like, You asked to hear a story. And yeah. then, you know, at the end, we go, she's in her quarters. She's got her meditation candle going. She opens a little case, and inside is the, her handbag, the handbag, the purse that uh, Tamir had. Mm-hmm. So we are like, ooh, okay. Ooh. Also, why are you going to waste my time 40 minutes telling a story, and it's not even true? Well, no. <laughs> she, you know, she woke up, and then she realized she was Avery Brooks. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> why not? Yes. You can't destroy an idea. No, I'm putting my fingers to my temples as he says it because he's like, you can't destroy an idea. (laughs) But that this this was the most important thing to me. And that's why I wanted to begin the episode with the text crawl that you see that you're going to see, which is you are you are the dreamer and the dream. This this is very important to all three of these episodes. Really just uh, wonderful. But. This this one I really did enjoy, and it really kind of you know again like far beyond the stars, it really knocked me on my butt. What did you think of it? I enjoyed it. Uh, of the th- I'm trying to think of like of these three episodes, which one did I enjoy the most? I would say it's very close, but I would say I enjoyed this one the second most. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I would say I enjoyed uh, Beyond the Stars. I enjoy that the, the most, and then the last one, the, the, the <clears throat> Voyager one. I say I enjoyed that the least, but I still enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree. I would agree. I think I think Far Beyond the Stars and Carbon Creek come very close. Yeah. You know, Far Beyond the Stars edges it out more because I feel like the story was a lot. It was more significant. It was something that we could relate to within our generation. Mm-hmm. And 1159, also we can relate that. Very, very much relate to that being because it's 1999. But mm-hmm. that was a little more cute. That was a little more cute. And Carbon Creek is, is really just... And, it sort of paints Vulcans in a different light. You never thought that they would be sympathetic there. She, I mean, Tamir's kind of the heavy in the episode. She's always telling, she's always bossing them around because she is their commanding officer, right? And she's telling them, don't get involved. Don't save people. Don't save those people in the mine. Mestral goes in there with his phaser and a tricorder. She helps him. She eventually helps him. And then she covers for him when he decides he's going to disappear. They, did, they, did they have the prime directive? Well, they don't. They talk uh, about a prime directive or something? The Vulcans? Like a Vulcan version of that? I definitely would. I, I would assume yes, because she's always busting uh, Archer's balls about not interfering. She says mm-hmm. we shouldn't interfere. Don't interfere. And he's like, I don't understand. I want to interfere. I want to help these people. But you realize oh, that by helping them, you might hurt them. Eventually, Future Man comes in and they Future Man. Uh, future Man. They interfere a lot with a lot. Uh, buy low, sell high. Yes. <laughs> uh, okay. So I guess that 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 wrap up this episode. Uh, but uh, if if you haven't seen these episodes, I don't think I've spoiled the be- the you know because there's nothing to spoil about them because they're alternate realities and they're alternate time periods and it's not exactly time travel. It just places our characters in different points in time. So watch them; they're really good, really fun episodes. 
And once again, thank you. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, it's really great to listen to these episodes. Next time we will be talking about cause and effect. Next time we will be talking about cause and effect. Next time we will be talking about cause and effect. I feel like I've been saying this over and over again. Huh? Anyway, <laughs> next time we'll be talking about cause and effect. <laughs> so uh, until then, uh, I'm David Lawler. And I'm David Anderson. And we'll see you at the movies. You have been listening to Ship to Ship, a Star Trek podcast, with your hosts, David Lawler and David B. Anderson. To find out more about us, subscribe to our YouTube channel or visit us at www.blissville.net or on Facebook at Misadventures in Blissville. Good night.